So now that you've seen a little bit about the different ways in which mutations in RAS can cause disease and how we still don't fully understand why some of those mutations are so consequential in certain cells but not others, uh, I think you'll see why there's still a lot of really interesting questions about RAS signaling and RAS biology to understand, uh, which is a great segue into the last portion of this lecture in which we discuss a little bit the frontiers uh, in RAS signaling, so questions people are trying to answer, and some of the interesting techniques uh, and approaches that people are using. So I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about some systems and synthetic biological approaches to understand RAS signaling. Um, I'll briefly talk about this optogenetic control of RAS signaling, which is the preview for the paper I chose for uh, Friday's discussion section. And I'll also talk about ways in which people are starting to look in a much more uh, big picture way at how different effectors in cells are being used by RAS. And then I'll also talk a little bit about advances people have been making in drug development, new successes, basically people are trying to find ways to specifically target oncogenic alleles of RAS uh, with small molecule drugs. And so to dive in there, you know, at this point, I'm sure you've learned a lot about RAS, but the, the complexity of RAS signaling that we've observed and the, the differences in the different cell types really create some challenges for understanding specificity. So we've got all these different things that can activate RAS. We've got all these different things that it can communicate to. Um, we don't fully, you know, we understand the basic logic of how RAS works, but we don't fully understand uh, this signal processing that's going on. And so one interesting approach, for example, we saw that uh, NGF and EGF produce different transient versus sustained uh, signals inside the cell. Um, and so, you know, an, an emerging hypothesis in the field is that different patterns or dynamic types of stimulation uh, or activation of RAS can produce, produce different uh, outcomes or decisions by the cells. Uh, but it's kind of been hard to study that systematically because... Um, you know, you, we've been constrained by the types of dynamics that different signaling ligands produce. And so what if we could artificially control, uh, what if we could artificially control SOS recruitment to the plasma membrane? Uh, if this were possible, then we could basically mimic, um, we could basically mimic what happens when a receptor, uh, binds ligand and activates SOS, but we would control how much gets there and when. And if we did this, for example, we could deliver short pulses of GEF activity to the membrane, we could recruit it for long periods of time, we could recruit different oscillations, and then we could ask, if you give cells different patterns of stimulation, what do the cells do? And for Friday's paper, I'm going to tell you about a really cool uh, uh, paper from several years ago that beautifully implemented an experimental system to be able to do this, in which they replaced this kind of native growth factor recruitment strategy with a light inducible recruitment strategy. So they made a synthetic system in which when they shown a particular uh, wavelength of light on the cell, it would result in uh, the catalytic domain from uh, the son of seminalist gap to be recruited to the plasma membrane, which as you know will then activate RAS and then go on to activate RAF and so on. And if they shy, take that light away, now uh, this GEF dissociates and uh, the signaling input has been removed. And in this paper we'll discuss, they learned a tremendous amount of information about how dynamic activation contributes to signal processing uh, using the system. And I think it's a, a fantastic example of how if you understand how RAS signaling works, the logic, then you could build this system to really interrogate its function in a, in a basically kind of super novel way. Um, and this is just showing you, for example, that the system works when they shine light on it. Uh, it leads to ERK translocation into the, to the nucleus only when they shine this light on it. And so that's just kind of a sneak preview for that uh, discussion. Um, and another interesting point, uh, another interesting area to think about, especially when we're trying to think about why some cells behave differently from other, it comes in terms of the downstream effector usage. So looking systems-wide instead of just RAF. So for example, we went through this uh, pathway in great detail, growth factor leads to activation of RAF, and RAF is absolutely a very important effector protein. But there are more than 60 other different effectors that could be present inside the cell at different amounts and different levels 
And so we might be missing a lot of what's going on in RAS signaling, especially differences in RAS signaling between different cell types, if we only focus on the RAF effector itself. And so there was a really interesting paper, uh, which I'll post on Canvas, that decided to try to look systems wide at effector usage. And uh, this paper relied on a technique called BioID, which is basically a technique that will label everything in the cell that's very close to your protein of interest with biotin. And biotin is a very easily capturable uh, affinity handle, uh, which means that if you um, uh, label a bunch of stuff in the cell with biotin, you can easily isolate it and then identify what proteins had this label by mass spec. And um, what the authors of this paper here that I'm going to post decided to do was to use this BioID technique on the RAS GTPase. And by basically performing BioID using RAS as their bait, they could label all the different downstream effectors inside the cell that RAS was interacting with, not just RAF. And they could look at all of those all at once by mass spectrometry. And when they did this, I thought something that was really interesting was they, in addition to, to uh, the very classical things that we know interact with um, RAS, uh, the authors of this paper identified over 130 new RAS interactions that had not previously been reported. And to me, it's just like you, you see a paper like this and you realize that sometimes if we focus too intensely on just RAF signaling, we're missing, you know, 90% of what's going on when RAS gets activated. Um, and so techniques like these are giving us an opportunity to really look at the complexity of RAS signaling uh, in a completely new way. And one of the interesting examples that they found that was that uh, perhaps uh, you'll learn about more in this class was that there's a an entire pathway that was not known to be uh, regulated by RAS, which is the mTOR pathway, uh, which controls the expression of a variety of genes that are known in known to be important for proliferation and tumor genesis. And through this study, they were able to find that RAS GTP can actually bind and activate uh, the mTOR complex in uh, at least some of the cell types that they were looking at. Okay, so that's just an example of how you know people are trying to use modern methods to uh, approach some of these questions in RAS signaling. But what about this? What about this goal to eventually target RAS uh, with different drugs or, or exploit our understanding of RAS signaling to be able to fight those cancers? I mean, like we said, 95% people who have pancreatic cancer have a mutation in RAS. So what can we do about it? And, you know, you'd think it would be straightforward, uh, but despite more than three decades of effort by academics here in, in uh, universities and in an industry settings where, where pharmaceutical companies have been looking for this, no effective anti-RAS inhibitors had reached the clinic. And for a while, people had this mindset that, uh, RAS oncoproteins were just something that you couldn't develop drugs for. Um, and of course, that just seems a little bit pessimistic. Um, and But there are some real challenges to overcome. And one is that the active sites of these uh, GTPases, you know, they bind nucleotide with really high affinity. So you're not going to be able to just stick something else in that uh, nucleotide binding site to act as an inhibitor. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, you need to be able to selectively target oncogenic signaling while leaving ordinary signals intact and that's because you know lots of cells in your body need they need rad signaling all the time they need you know signals that say oh okay now it's time to grow i need that input uh and if you found some drug that just squanched uh all rad signaling then you know that would be a problem for your ordinary cells that uh you know rely on the wild type signaling so how do you target oncogenic signaling specifically and so sometime back there was a beautiful uh paper that um, I'll just kind of walk you through, in which uh, they developed uh, inhibitors of the G12C alle uh, uh, oncogenic allele of KRAS that were able to allosterically control uh, the affinity of those um, oncogenic alleles of RAS for GTP and consequently affect how they interact with effectors. And I just wanted to share this because I think it's actually a really clever idea. The authors of this paper decided they wanted to exploit the increased reactivity of, of cysteine in a G12C mutant 
uh, as the basis for their target. So cysteine, as you learned in your organic chemistry class, is going to be a lot more reactive than uh, many other amino acids that you could put in this position. And so the chemists that are associated with this paper said, let's see if we can exploit that cysteine's chemistry to find drugs that will have some sort of reactivity towards that residue. And so they used this interesting uh, library of uh, sulfur-based uh, compounds that could react with cysteines to screen for uh, drugs that might be able to specifically bind to um, the G12C allele of RAS. And they were able to find a number of compounds that seem to bind uh, with excellent potency. And importantly, so here's an example of one of those compounds here and the, and the crystal structure of it uh, in, uh, attached to the RAS protein via the cysteine. And what's really beautiful about this compound is that this drug is able to very strongly uh, bind to and modify oncogenic alleles, the G12C allele of RAS, but the wild type allele is completely untouched. And from that perspective of uh, targeting oncogenic alleles specifically, this is exactly what you want. You want something that goes after the def the, the uh, offensive alleles, but leaves the wild type proteins intact. Um, and what they found was that if they treated um, RAS G12C alleles with this compound, uh, like ordinarily G12C would undergo potent exchange by guanine exchange factors like SOS, but following modification with these compounds, the G12C alleles could now no longer be activated by SOS. So not only do these drugs bind to RAS G12C, but they actually impact its ability to be activated. And of course, perhaps most importantly, at least in a subset of cell lines, uh, cancer cell lines that were driven by G12C uh, mutations, um, treatment of those cells with the drug uh, led to an induction of apoptosis and a loss of viability of the cells. So at least for a few of these cell lines, like these H1792 lines or these Cal1 lines, treatment with this drug seemed to decrease their viability and stimulate apoptosis, whereas other cell lines that uh, were not driven by G12C alleles, the drug had very little effect at all. Now, I will say that at the time of this publication, the amount of drug being used, 10 micromolar, is an astronomically huge uh, amount of drug to be trying to use to inhibit uh, cell proliferation in any clinical context. But given that this was the first time that anyone had ever shown that you could target RAS with an allele, let alone target the oncogenic form specifically, uh, this really did provide an absolutely great starting point for optimization. And um, there's been a lot of companies that have now been spun off, uh, and I believe actually this drug is in clinical trials now, or not this exact compound, but following optimization in industry, they have really found some compounds uh, based on this approach that look like they're on path uh, to make a huge impact in the treatment of G12C driven cancers. Um, and so with that, I will. Um, call it a wrap and um, I look forward to um, discussing uh, the paper uh, that I selected with all of you on Friday uh, and I will see you then.